But does it live up to the hype? So many things say they're true and better, new and improved, and then the disappointment sets. Is that Jesus' situation? Or is he, as the author of Hebrews claims, truly the one who is true and better? That's what we're working on, trying to figure out in this series. Uh, before I jump into that, a couple things just to make sure you know. I want to add on to what Janet just told you about Easter, okay? Um, Easter's going to be awesome, uh, we're gonna, but, but to, for Easter to work, two things have got to happen, okay? For Easter to work, two things have got to happen. Number one, you need to invite the people God's got for you to invite. Who are the people you know who have lost sight of the hope of Jesus Christ and you need to bring them with you, okay? That's the first thing that's got to happen. The second thing that's got to happen is about 400 people have to decide to worship on Saturday night and about 300 people have to decide to worship at 815. For us to have room for all the guests that will come, uh, that's got to happen. Just That's got to be. Now, to be clear, if you invite people and they... 45 or 11, 15, well, you bring the people you've invited. That's the most important thing. But if you're able to worship on Saturday night or you're able to worship at 8, 15, just figure that out now. Make a plan now. Say, yep, that's it. That's what I'm going to do. That will really help us reach the people we need to reach on Easter, okay? Another way that you can contribute to what we're doing here in the Mission of the Church, I want to tell you a little bit about, is day camp. So last year, we changed uh, the strategy for what we had this thing, Vacation Bible School. It was a, a week-long, half-day experience. Uh, but we began to realize that lots of people could not participate in a half-day experience. Because if, you know, if, if you're working or whatever, and you don't have a way to get your kid in the middle of the day... Uh, it doesn't work with people's child care arrangements, with summer plans. And so we switched to a full day experience last year. We really saw the fruit. It was a powerful and meaningful improvement as far as who we could reach with our uh, summer ministry. But a full day experience just takes a lot and a half day experience does. So we need all hands on deck. There is a role for everybody with day camp. And I hope you'll consider what your role might be. Uh, if you want to find out how you can help, we've got half-day jobs, we've got all-day jobs, we've got one-day jobs, we've got all-week jobs, we've got jobs you can do before it starts, jobs you can do after it's over. There's a role for everybody. If you're on campus and want to get more information, stop by the Kids Connection Desk, ask them, or anybody can go online to fcc-jc.org slash serve. And the top button you'll see is for Kids Day Camp. Just let them know, hey, I don't know what I can do, but I'll do something if we all contribute. I mean, this is our DNA, right? We're, we're, about, we're all about making disciples and serving one another. And this is such a huge and important way to do it. I know lots of people where their story of faith starts with VBS or day camp or something like this. So we don't even know what story we're going to write in some kid's life. Um, but to pull it off, we've got a lot of people need to pitch in. So jump in and help with that if you can. All right, let's get to Hebrews. It has been about the book of Hebrews, observing his persistent claim that Jesus is true and better. Jesus is the true and better messenger, is how the book of Hebrews starts, saying God's got prophets and God's got angels, but if you really want to know the message of God, you look at Jesus. Uh, and then Janet focused our attention on the second couple chapters, and, and we saw that Jesus is the true and better lawgiver because Jesus is the true and better rest giver. Because only Jesus' law, only Jesus' covenant actually leads us to the rest we all want. And this last week, we looked at Jesus as the true and better priest. A priest is someone who connects us with God, who gives us access to God, and we looked at that last week. Uh, we're in the middle of a big section of Hebrews uh, where the author of Hebrews spends about eight chapters trying to solve the big human problem. Uh, the big human problem is this. Imperfect, God is perfect. We are sinners, God is holy. And this creates a relational chasm that we cannot cross and God provides a way of restoring that relationship through Jesus Christ. That's the big section we're in the middle of here. And last week, we concluded our message by observing that because Jesus is the true and better high priest, he saves completely and eternally 
so that we can approach God confidently and we will be received mercifully. I will just say, I've had a handful of people reach out to me this week and say that there was something about those chapters from Hebrews and last week's message that gave them some clarity on the grace of God that maybe they hadn't had before. And so I'll just say, if you weren't here last week and you've kind of lost sight on what is it Jesus does for us to restore our access to God, maybe you want to go check it out on YouTube or find it on the church website or something you, uh, like it apparently helps some other people. Now then this week, we're going to pick up right where we left off. He's just finished talking about the kind of high priest Jesus is, and he's going to move to talk about uh, something else here. Uh, We're in Hebrews chapter 8. If you've got your Bible, pull it out to Hebrews chapter 8. If you've got a phone with you, uh, just maybe you've got a Bible app on your phone, or you can just Google Hebrews chapter 8. The words will be up on the screen, but we're going to look at like three chapters today, and so you might want the text in front of you to try to keep up. We're going to move pretty fast. We're going to start with Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1. And he knows we got a little lost, so he's going to start with a summary. He says, the main point of what we're saying is this. We have that kind of high priest. That is the kind of high priest who can save completely and eternally so that we can approach God confidently and be received mercifully. We have that kind of high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of majesty in heaven, who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by a being. Every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. And so it's also necessary for this one to have something to offer. This is a hint about where he's about to go with this text. Jesus also has to have something to sacrifice if he's going to be a high priest. If we were, he were on earth, he would not be a priest, for there are already priests who offer gifts prescribed by the law. They serve at a sanctuary that is a copy and a shadow of what is in heaven. This is why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle, see to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown to you on the mountain. But in fact, the ministry that Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is mediator is superior to the old one, since the new covenant is established on better promises. For if there was nothing wrong with the first covenant, well, they they wouldn't have had to go looking for another one, right? But God found fault with the people. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt because they did not remain faithful to my covenant. And I turned away from them, declares the Lord. He continues in this quote, we'll skip down to verse 13, by calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete. And what is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. The the, the covenant was a set of promises between God and uh, the people to maintain a relationship. It included rules and regulations and worship services and sacrifices and priestly practices, all designed to maintain the relationship between God and God's people. Now, we'll skip the beginning of chapter 9. He, there he kind of summarizes some of the things about what they all would have known. He gets back to focus on Jesus in verse 11. So skip to 9, 11 with me. But when Christ came as high priest of the good things that are now already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made with human hands. That is to say, that is not part of creation. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves. Remember we said a high priest has to have something to sacrifice. And he says he didn't come sacrificing goats and calves. But he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean sanctify them so they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead we may serve the living 
God. Look at that text just for a second. This reveals the purpose. We'll talk about this in just a little more. But the purpose of the sacrificial system is so that we can have a clean conscience and return to God's service. The purpose is always so that we can re-engage obedient service to God. He goes on, for this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant, that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, and now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from sins committed under the first covenant. Jesus isn't just the true and better priest. He is also the true and better sacrifice. Every priest has to have something to sacrifice. Jesus sacrifices himself. Now, last week we said to really understand the significance of this claim that Jesus is the true, we've got to know what priests do. Priests restore access between the people and their God. And we talked about that last week. Well, the same thing is true here. For to know what a big deal it is that Jesus is the true and better sacrifice, we've got to know what were sacrifices even for? Like, how did it all work? Uh, and, and the logic of the sacrificial system can be a little confusing to us today. And so I just want to talk a little bit about how the, kind of the, the basic logic, the basic moral logic that underlies the sacrificial system. It starts with this observation. Every mistake, error, sin, wrongdoing, everything like that creates a debt. This isn't particularly a spiritual observation. It's just an observation about the fabric of the universe. It's an observation that pops up in every philosophical and religious tradition. This observation isn't limited to Christianity. It's instinctively know it, right? Like if you say you're going to pick a friend up at the airport, right? And then you forget and they have to wait there three hours, you know, back in the days before cell phones, they had to go find a quarter and use a pay phone or whatever, you know? When you finally see your friend, what do you, you instinctively say, oh my goodness, I am so sorry. I owe you big time, man. I am, oh, I'm, I, I owe you? You see, we naturally know when we do somebody wrong, there's a debt there, isn't it? Or, or maybe in a moment of weakness, you gossip about a friend and you tell a story about them that, that makes them look bad and embarrasses. And then later you say, oh, I'm so sorry. What can I do to make it up? Right? See, we know that when you do something wrong, break something, hurt something, lie about something, betray someone, break a trust, break a promise, that a debt is created. And some of these debts we can pay back. Television, you can buy them a new television. But most of them can't be paid back, right? Like if, if you, somebody tells you a secret and then you go tell 10 people, how do you pay that back? What's the unit of exchange, right? And so the sacrificial system observes that the same is true with God, except with God, None of our debts can be paid back. Like all, all the ways we betray God and disappoint God and wrong God and break God's law, there's a debt there that can't be paid back. And, and just to be clear, nobody in the Old Testament uh, thought that the sacrifice itself sort of made you square with God. Like you were like, hey God, I broke four commandments, but I also killed three pigeons, so I think we're good, right God? No, that's not the way they thought it worked. But it was that the sacrifice acknowledged the reality of the debt, that there was a It acknowledged the graciousness of God's forgiveness, and it expressed a desire to repent. That was the rhythm of the sacrificial system. We knew there was a debt, we trusted in God's grace, and we were repenting. And the purpose of the system was actually to free them from the debt of their covenant breaking so that they could then be restored to the covenant and live again in obedience. 
right? And, and without this system to kind of acknowledge the debt, have the debt forgiven, there'd be no motivation to live in obedience. Well, we're going to talk about this more, but let me just give you this image right now. It kind of can be rattling around your head when we, go, when we go back to the text. Imagine you buy a new car, right? And when you first get a new car, like everything works and it's got no bumps or scratches on it, so you're going to be inclined to take really good care of it, right? You know, you'll avoid every pothole, you'll be careful where you park and open the You can do that thing where you put a blanket on top of it to protect the paint and all that thing that people do. But over time, damage happens, right? There's a hailstorm, you hit a pothole, something breaks. And as the car begins to break down and get dents and scratches in it, you sort of don't worry about it as much, right? You drive a little more carelessly. You get an extra bump and you, you know, who cares, right? That the damage to it makes you actually over time care less about the car. This happened to me recently. I uh, was backing up in my own driveway, a place I back up all the time, but I'd forgotten I'd left my tailgate down. So I backed up, I thought, to within about six inches of this tree, except my tailgate sticks, sticks out two feet. So it crunched my tailgate pretty hard. Um, and then a thing happened. I had to go get it fixed. So you don't care about it all that much until you go pay to get that dent taken out that broken piece repaired. And let's say you paid top dollar to get it all fixed back up just like it was when it was brand new. $1,000 here and $500 here and $1,200 here and it's fully restored. Well, now you're gonna care about it more than you ever. The only person who's more careful with their car than a new car owner is somebody who's had their car fixed, right? You can be sure now when I back up in my own driveway, I look like 12 times, make sure the trees haven't moved, right? That's what happened, in case you're curious. All right. This was the function of the sacrificial system. To acknowledge that our sin has a cost. A cost we can't repay. A cost that is forgiven by Christ. And then call us back to faithful living. The problem was that the old system was caught, we were caught in this constant cycle of sacrificing again and again. Because we we broke and again. Look down in verse 924. God has a new plan in a new covenant. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence, nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again the way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise, Christ would have to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But he appeared once for all at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Just as people are destined to die once and then to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many. And he will appear a second time not to bear sin. Oh, I love this. When he comes back, he's not going to be talking about sin when he comes back. He took care of that the first time. When he comes back, he will bring salvation to those who wait for him. Oh, the love of Christ. Oh, the love of Christ that he saw a debt we couldn't repay. And he paid it. Once for all on a cross. Our author goes back and talks a little bit about the first covenant again and the way the priests used to work. And then he jumps back to Jesus. Verse 11. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which never can fully pay the debt, never can fully take away the sins. But when this priest... Our true and better priest, when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down because he was done. He didn't have to get back up and offer more sacrifices. He was done. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool for one sacrifice. By one sacrifice, rather, he has made 
perfect forever those who are being made holy. We've got to look at this verse. This is the same paradox we talked about in the last chapter. It, it looks like a paradox. Put the, go, go back up one. I want him to see verse 14 there for a second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it, it seems like a paradox, right? It says, for by one sacrifice, he, he has made perfect. That's past tense, like it's already done. Who has he made perfect? Well, those who are being made holy. That's present perfect. That's ongoing. Well, which is it? Are we already made perfect or are we being made holy? That seems confusing. But this is actually exactly the way the sacrifice of Christ works. By the sacrifice of Christ, our debt is completely paid so that we can actually begin to live in obedience. The full sufficiency of Christ's salvation is not in contradiction with the full redemption that Christ plans to work or make each other possible. It is because Christ plans to make us holy that he is the one sufficient to sacrifice for our sakes. And it's because by his sacrifice we, are, we have been made perfect that he is the exact one who will make us holy. He goes on, the Holy Spirit testifies about this. First he says, this is the covenant I will make with them. After that time, says the Lord, I will put my law in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. And then he adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. Where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. Your debt has been paid. How? Because we have a true and better sacrifice. I just want to offer a word of peace to some of you today. Some of you, you have so much trouble believing that you are living with paid debts. And you come before God again and again as if these debts haven't been paid. And you're like, God, did you know about this? I did this wrong. And God, you're, God, I know you're holding this one over my head. Oh, my goodness, God. You must be so ticked about that. And God just says, those debts have been paid. Why do you keep talking about those debts you never could have paid back anyway? Like it wouldn't even been a meaningful conversation even if Jesus hadn't died on a cross because you couldn't have paid them back anyway. Why bother bringing it up? But all more to the point, they've been paid. Uh, the Bible uses uh, family images a lot to help us understand the restoration God intends for us. I love these metaphors. The Bible often describes God as a father and Jesus as an elder brother and us as a younger sibling. And I've got an elder brother and he's, he's an awesome elder brother. I mean, he's not as good as Jesus, but he's pretty close. I got a great elder brother and I am a younger brother. And, and so I always kind of resonate with that image. And, and, and I just kind of think about this image for a second. Uh, imagine you're the younger sibling sibling, you know, your younger brother, or younger sister, you know, and you're the younger sibling, and, um, and man, you were sort of, you still sort of are. Like, I mean, as a kid, you burned down the garage, like, and everybody knows it was you, you know, and, it, and it's sort of been awkward, you know, and that was a bum thing, and, and, and you stole one of your dad's goats so you could go have a party with your friends, but you left the gate open, and half the goats got out, and they were hit by a truck, and it was just messy, you know, and, 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 you, and you weren't allowed to drive your dad's nice car, but you did anyway, and you went out, and you just trashed the thing, you wrecked it, and it was just a disaster, and your dad loved that car, and, and worse to that, you've just embarrassed your dad all around town like you're always using his name and then you don't come through and you're just a total embarrassment to your father's name like you have made the whole family name worse the reputation of your family has just plummeted because you embarrass your family name everywhere you go you know you know and 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 and, and over time when you would like go home for you know Sunday lunch or go home for Thanksgiving like you'd be sitting there on the table and what you owed your dad, you know, and, and, like, and you're sort of a mess up, and you're like, I'm never going to pay back for that barn. Oh, and the car, and oh my goodness, I have humiliated him in town. Like, there's no way I'm going to pay back what I owe my dad. Like, this is impossible. And so eventually, it just got so awkward, you just sort of quit going home, you know, and you just kind of went off and did your own thing, and you're still sort of humiliating your family everywhere you go, but now at least you don't have to face your dad and just that impossible debt you'll never repay. And, and then one day, your brother comes and finds you. And he says like, dude, why have you left the family? 
And you're like, I cannot sit there. I owe him for a barn and a car, 12 goats. And the way I have humiliated him with everybody, you know, using the family name but not living up to the family values, you know, I just, I, I can't, I can't face him. With and your brother says, what are you talking about? I have paid all those debts. I rebuilt the garage. I fixed the car. I found the goats. I have been at work throughout the city rebuilding the reputation of our family name everywhere you go to trash it. And you're like, you don't know what I did yesterday. And your brother's like, yes, I do. And I paid them back too. All the debts have been paid. Just come home. That's the story. That you're like, but what about the thing? You're like, yeah, I'm going to pay that one back too. Like I've got a plan already. And, and then you say, to your brother, you're like, did you do all this for dad? And he's like, no, you idiot. I did it for you. I don't want a world without you. And you will never pay off what you owe. So I just did. And I'm never going to bring it up. And we're never going to talk about it. And I'm not going to hold it against you. And if you make it weird at Christmas because I paid off your debts, that's on you, buddy. I'm not making it weird. It's covered. That is the point of a true and better sacrifice. And good news. If you've been lost, I told you how to read Hebrews, right? Complicated theological sections. Clear, blunt Command. Somebody reached out to me this week, said, Ethan, I love reading Hebrews now. I just read it, and I'm like, I don't know what this means, and I don't know what this means, and I don't know what this means, but I don't worry about it, because I keep reading, and eventually I'll find the word, therefore. And if you're following along your Bibles, you may know that's what we get next, Hebrews 10, 19. Therefore. Who our high priest is. Therefore, in light of the kind of sacrifice he offers, in light of the fact that every debt has been paid, we no longer owe anything. That's what the therefore means of Hebrews 10, 19. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we do have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, since there is a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body, since we do have a great high priest over the house of God who has offered himself as a sacrifice, he's going to tell us three things to do, okay? Three commands. Number one, let us draw near to God. Just walk right up. Your debts are paid. Having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience, having our bodies washed with pure water. Number one, draw near. Number two, verse 23, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. This is actually foreshadowing what we're going to talk about next week in chapters 11 and 12 of Hebrews. And the third thing, so number one, draw near. Number two, and num verse 24, the third thing, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day approaching. Now, this last command confuses some people. They're like, wait a second. I thought we were talking about grace. And now all of a sudden, he talks about obedience. Like, I knew it was a trick. The whole grace thing must be a trick. Because here he says, we got to spur one another on to love and good deeds. See, it's all back to good deeds. We make, there's a, there's a crucial logical error that so many of us make when we're trying to understand the proclamation of Jesus Christ. That we think grace and obedience are logically opposed. When in fact, Quite the opposite is the claim of Christianity. The claim of Christianity is that only grace makes obedience conceivable or possible. Uh, now, to understand this, I've got to go through a couple things, so bear with me. The first thing we've got to know is this, that moralism does not make people moral. Moralism is this idea, that if you do good things, then you're a good person, 
And if you do bad things, you're a bad person. That's moralism. And we all want to be good people, so we should do good things, so we should be good people. You know, this is what we say to our little kids. Be a good boy and girl, that kind of thing, right? This is moralism. And many of you are confused. You're like, wait, I thought that's what Christianity was. Isn't that Christianity? We should do good things, so we should do good people. Is that the whole point? No, it's not Christianity. And it does not work. Because moralism always fails because eventually you don't do good things. And then you're like, oh, well, then I'm not a good person. And then why bother taking care of the car? You know, I mean, if I guess I should just, you know, who cares, right? Here's another thing that doesn't work legalism doesn't help anybody keep the law. It just doesn't. And again, my apologies, but many of you, the thing you think is Christianity is actually legalism, and it's not Christianity. Legalism says this if we would just keep the rules, we wouldn't get punished. But if you break the rules, you're in trouble. And again, lots of you thought, wait, isn't that what Christianity, isn't that Jesus' message? No, that isn't Jesus' message. And again, legalism does not help people keep the law because eventually you'll break the rules. And under legalism, once you break the rules, you're like, oh, well, I'm already going to jail. Might as well break that rule too, you know? Nobody who robs a bank and then shoot somebody on the way out, worries about whether they run a red light, right? It's too late. The cat's out of the bag. Also charge me for failure to yield, you know? Yes, officer, in addition to the 20 to life, I'll pay the $67 fine. No, no, you see, legalism doesn't work because once you realize you've broken the law and you're getting punished anyway, you might as well break another law. Moralism doesn't make us moral. Legalism does not. And, and some of you are acting like you think you're, the way you're going to fix everybody around you is by becoming a legalist and tell them about all the laws they're breaking and all the punishments they're going to get. No, that is not going to help anybody. It never has. And it isn't what the gospel is about. I'll tell you another thing that doesn't work. It turns out humanism doesn't work either. Humanism is the idea that each of us is our own moral compass. We are in charge. There is no law. There is no standard. We are in charge of what the standard is. Figure out what works for you and do that. That doesn't work either. It just leaves the chaos and selfishness and destruction. We're selfish people. If we decide what works for us, we'll do that. We always do what hurts other people and helps us. I mean, we're just not very good at this. So what could lead to the... Well, grace and then repentance. You know, you've started driving sloppy because your car's all beat up anyway. Ah, who cares? One more dent doesn't matter. And so somebody comes along and says, oh, if you wanted to, I could fix everything wrong with your car. And then, for the first time in a long time, you'd be like, well, in that case, I might actually try and learn how to drive again. And then you'd hit, break something else. And I'm like, okay, it's okay. I'll fix that too. I'm just going to keep fixing your car so that you can actually drive the way you're meant to drive. That's the way grace and repentance works. See, your life is a mix of good and bad, you know, health and sickness. And all the bad, the broken promises, the times you've disappointed yourself and disappointed your loved ones and disappointed God. Debt attached to all that. A debt you can't repay. And if you can't repay your debts, why bother getting a job, right? You'll die bankrupt anyway. But in Christ, all those debts are paid off. You got a clean slate. And so the Bible says things like this Your labor in the Lord is never in vain. What you do for God eternally glorifies God. All of a sudden, the good stuff matters because the bad stuff got taken care of. It's only the reality of grace that makes it even make sense to try to live a life of obedience. That's the amazing thing. And of course, you'll fail to live a life of obedience. I know that. And the reality of grace is sufficient for that. Which is why 
The, the accomplished by the sacrifice of Christ is why the next thing he does is offer a very stern warning. And I want you to understand this warning uh, because I want you to know who it applies to and who it doesn't because it might apply to you, but sometimes the wrong people apply this warning. Here's the, the warning he goes to. Right after this wonderful word of hope, he gives this warning. Verse 26, it's the next verse if you're following along your text. If we deliberately keep on sinning, After we have received the knowledge of truth, no sacrifice of sins is left. I want to talk about what this warning means. Um, We often misread the warning. Uh, The good news is the only thing you have to do to read the warning correctly is pay attention to what it actually says. Okay? This is not talking about those of us who, in our ignorance and weakness, persist in sinful habits. Everybody does that. The Bible's super clear that that's not what this is about. Uh, if you're saying, I'm struggling with sexual faithfulness, I sin to my, the, my desire to look good, to lie, so I look good in front of other people's like that's not what this is about. Go read Romans 7, 1 John 1 and 2. Go read other places in Hebrews very clearly. The thing he's talking about is very specific. Number one, someone about it, it's deliberate. So if you deliberately, that means it's on purpose with the intention of showing an affront to God. Deliberate, on purpose. Keep on. That means it's persistent and you don't stop. Now, the, the flip side, the good news of that is any sin you're ready to repent of, the debt's paid. Because then you're not keeping on, right? But the keeping on. And with knowledge of the truth. This is not something you accidentally do or unknowingly do or you do because you're confused. It's something you do with full awareness. Well, what is this thing that we might, we're might we warned to not do deliberately, keep, knowingly? Well, he goes on. No sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment, of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two to three witnesses. How much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified them, who has insulted the Spirit of grace? Here we have further description of what he's talking about. He isn't talking about sin as in, I keep on getting angry with my kids. He's talking about an intentional rejection of the sacrifice of Christ on your behalf. Someone who has persistently said, I don't need Jesus. I don't need his sacrifice. I don't need him. My hope is not in him. My trust is not in him. And he says, for the one who persists in that posture, and that, of course, makes sense to us, right? This would be like if you met a doctor who could cure any disease with his pill. Except for, if you don't take the pill, well, he can't cure the diseases. And that's what this is saying. That all your sins are paid for. All the debt is paid. Unless you deliberately, persistently, and knowingly reject the very sacrifice of Christ made on your behalf. And so that's the warning of the text. There is a way to have your debt paid. And there is a way to refuse to let him do it. Imagine our younger sister, our younger brother, in the story we told earlier, and the elder brother comes and says, dude, come home. Your debts are paid. I rebuilt the barn. I fixed the car. Imagine the one who says, no. I'll repay those debts or die trying. And the elder brother just says, then you're going to die. You owe too much. You don't have a plan. You are bankrupt. But I've paid them back. Like No creditor is coming looking for you. All you've got to do is say, oh, okay, I'll trust you. I'll trust you. But of course, our author does not think that this warning applies to his readers. You see, by the end of the chapter, he's very hopeful. Verse 39, he says, but we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed but to those who have faith and are saved. And I would just say, I hope that's true of you today. 
Your debt has been paid. Your relationship restored. So maybe let's end. Complicated theological sections, blunt, clear commands. Maybe we'll end today back with the blunt, clear commands. Hebrews 10, 19. Therefore, since we have confidence in this place, how? By the blood of Jesus. By a new and living way that has just been opened for us through the curtain. We can walk right in through his body. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, the very one who offers the sacrifice and who is the sacrifice, the one sacrifice once for all, for all people, for all sin, for all time, let us draw near to God with sincere hearts and the full assurance that faith brings. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for the one who promised is faithful. And then, let's figure out how we can challenge one another to love and good deeds because the debt's paid. We might as well obey Jesus. Let me pray for you. Gracious God, we thank you you the a true and better sacrifice that there is no debt remaining outstanding for those who have trusted in the salvation of Christ Jesus as their Lord and Savior and now have repented of their sin and live in obedience to him let us be those people call us back to you we we depend on your faithfulness we pray all this in Jesus name amen